My name is Carol Haber, and as the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts, I am delighted to welcome you to this exciting event. As Dean, one of my greatest pleasures is to travel around the country talking to our alumni and learning of their experience at Tulane and the paths they have taken since graduation. Perhaps no group is more interesting, and I admit, none more cool, than the large number of individuals who have made their way to the top of the entertainment business. I have been moved and inspired by their stories as well as impressed by their amazing achievements. What has also been extraordinary is their shared dedication to Tulane. Despite being incredibly busy and in constant demand, they have devoted their time and energy to the university. Nothing better represents their dedication than their willingness to make time in their busy schedules to participate in this panel. So I know you join me in thanking them for their appearance today. I would also like to acknowledge several people who have made this event possible. This event is co-sponsored by SLA and Newcomb Tulane College. The staff of Newcomb Tulane College, and especially Trina Beck, have worked very hard, have worked very hard putting together and organizing this seminar, as has the Dean of Newcomb Tulane, James McLaren. In my own office, my development officer, who said I wasn't allowed to say his name, Daniel Bizard, and <laughs> See, I listen to everything you say. And, and Suzanne Anderson, along with project director Sarah Minge, have taken what started out simply as a great idea and worked so hard to make it a reality. My greatest appreciation. Following the talk, we will have a reception outside the auditorium. I hope you all join us where we know that our speakers will be pleased to continue our conversation. Please, of course, check to see that your cell phones have been silenced. At this point, I would like to turn the podium over to our moderator, Beretta smith Shamad. Prof professor smith Shamad is a Media Studies Associate Professor and Chair of the Communication Department. Her work revolves around television representation, industry, and culture. Her first book, Shaded Lives, African American Women and Television, to con continues to be used in myriad media studies and women's studies courses. Her second book, Pimpin' Ain't Easy, Selling Black Entertainment Television, tackles the significance of BET in our media landscape. Her forthcoming anthology, Watching While Black, Centering the Television, thank you, Centering the Television of Black Audiences, examines, examines programming focused on and produced by African American community. Smith Shamad has published essays in Cinema Journal, Television and New Media, and Spectator. She has also worked in television news and continues to do documentary production. She is intimately engaged with K through 12 media literary efforts. And besides all that, she's terrific. So it is my pleasure to introduce and turn the panel over to Professor Smith Shamad. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't, let me. Good afternoon. I don't even think I'm leaving it. Do you need it? Well, I'll use it. Welcome to the panel, Tulane to Hollywood. I am excited to be here and to share the panel with such distinguished alumni of Tulane and alumni of the School of Liberal Arts. And I want to first introduce everyone and give you their extensive bio. And we're going to clap and say hooray, and then we're going to get into the meat <laughs> of talking about how they got from Tulane to Hollywood. I want to start with Mr. David Lonner to my left. He is the founder of the o um, Oasis Media Group, a management and, pr and production company based in Los Angeles. Under Oasis banner, David represents writers, directors, and producers in the film, television, and online content arenas. Prior to founding his own company, he was a talent agent at William Moore's agency from 2003 to 2009. He was previously a partner in, in Endeavor, in, at Endeavor Talent Agency, where he established their motion picture division. He also spent several years at Creative, Creative Artists Agency, CAA, and began his career at ICM. So as you can tell, he's been everywhere and is nothing like, and I know this from spending a little bit of time with him, he's nothing like Ari on Entourage. <laughs> Give no idea. David is a committed <laughs> philanthropist working on, with numerous organizations. He's a former board member of the Early Childhood Center at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles and former chairman of the Entertainment Division of the United Jewish Fund. Additionally, he is a board member of the Phase I Cancer Institute, American Parties Foundation, and the Entertainment Industry Foundation. 
David graduated from Tulane in 1984 with a BA in sociology. Please give him a hand. <laughs> to David's right, we, David's right, we have Mr. Jimmy Horowitz, a key member of Universal for nearly two decades. Jimmy is involved in all of the movie studio's business initiatives and helps manage day-to-day -day business operations. Under his leadership, Universal Pictures Stage Productions has enjoyed a growing live stage business, having had its biggest critical and commercial success with Wicked, which has grossed more than $1 billion worldwide, and Billy Elliot, which won 10 Tony Awards. The Hollywood Reporter dubbed Jimmy the Don of Deals <laughs> in the way that he has negotiated agreements <coughs> from the top of the marquee talent to the behind the scenes production people that makes possible the 16 to 24 movies, the 16 to 20 movies Universal releases each year. Prior to Universal, Jimmy served as counsel for the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. He earned his JD from George Washington University Law School and he graduated cum laude from here in 1983 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. Please welcome Jimmy Horowitz. <laughs> to his right, we have Mr. Chris Patrickin, Executive Vice President, Fox, Fil Fox Filmed Entertainment. As, as, ex as that, uh, if I can talk, as Executive Vice Pre President of Corporate Communications, which includes 20th Century Fox, Fox Searchlight, and 20th Century Fox Animation, Chris oversees the studio's internal and external corporate communications and strategy. He previously served as Senior Vice President of Corporate Communications for the William Morris Agency. A former journalist, he was also executive editor of Inside.com and Inside the Magazine, news editor and senior reporter for Variety, and has written for or contributed to the Los Angeles Times, GQ, Esquire, Premier Magazine, and National Public Radio, among others. He graduated here at Tulane with a degree in English in 1988. And I have to say, yay, 1988, because that's when I graduated. Please welcome Chris Patrick. <laughs> to Chris's right, we have Mr. Stephen Pearl. Since graduating from Tulane with a pol political science degree, he has become a film and television producer and writer and the co-owner of the Scarlet Fire Entertainment, which was founded in 2006 with his production partner, Alan Loeb. Throughout, through Scarlet Fire, Stephen is working on projects for working title films, Universal, Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony Pictures, Lionsgate TV, and 20th Century Fox TV Studios. He also co-wrote the screenplay and produced So Undercover, the upcoming film for singer actress Miley Cyrus, which was partially filmed here on Tulane's campus in January of this year, so some of you might have even participated. So, well, and Stephen also does, he didn't have it on his bio, but I, in talking with him and I looking on my own, he also does a number of speaking engagements around Los Angeles, talking to students about what it is that he does and encouraging them in that way. So please welcome 1985 graduate Stephen Pearl. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Harold Sylvester, actor, writer, producer, and president of Blue Bayou Productions. Harold Sylvester, veteran actor, is an Emmy Award winning writer producer whose credits include 17 feature films and more than 400 television programs. Harold's film credits include An Officer and a Gentleman, Uncommon Valor, Karina Karina, and a 1979 film that I actually remember seeing him for the first time in called Fast Break. Now, he, he's not trying to own that, but I, I remember it. <laughs> yeah. On TV, he has starred and guest starred in programs such as Hill Street Blues, Murder, She Wrote, NYPD Blue, A Different World, The Army Show, City of Angels, where he also served as writer-producer, and Married with Children, where he played the role of Griff, a shoe salesman working with Al Bundy. Also as a successful screenwriter, Sylvester has sold, and Harold has sold several screenplays. One, Passing Glory, a TNT or original movie about a New Orleans high school basketball game between a black high school and a white high school based on a true story. Fast Girls, about a girls' track team, and the, the Muhammad Ali story. He graduated from Tulane in 1972 with a major in theater. Please welcome Harold Sylvester and all of our panel <laughs> panelists. So I, I told them since we're coming, we're home for homecoming, we're excited, we're kicking it off, I wanted them to think a little bit and talk to us a little bit about their most significant or cherished 
memory about their time at Tulane. And I was told just one, so I told them they can be ish, they can be soft on it. But to talk about what th something significant or cherished uh, memory about being here at Tulane. So I'll just, I'll just start right here with David. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the thing that, that, uh, that for me is the most significant about this school is that I made the best friends of my life here who are still my best friends in life. I have uh, five guys, two of them who lived with me in the Sharp dorm freshman year and uh, three of them who lived in uh, um, Phelps. Phelps, yes. Uh, and uh, the journey that we had uh, from freshman year on to the junior abroad experience that we all had just has bonded us for life. And those five guys to this day are still my best friends in the world and it's the thing that has kept me rooted in, uh, in Tulane. Um, I'm sure you'll hear from a lot of us that uh, what David said is very true for me also. Um, coming here from the Northeast, I'm from New York, uh, you know, in 1979, was the was the the decision in my life that I had made that was the most um, kind of uh, silly at that time. I had no idea why I was coming here. There was nothing about it in particular. I really just didn't know where I wanted to go. And I think that's what's so incredible about the opportunity you get when you go to college is that um, you get to go somewhere brand new and start your life uh, basically over again. Whether you did or didn't like high school, you know, you grew up in a town where you were from, and that was what you knew. And coming here to a place that I didn't know anyone and knew nothing about New Orleans, um, I tell people all the time was the best decision I, I'd ever, I ever made, and I, and I still feel that way today. Um, the, the thing that I think is the most important for me about it is that it, you know, if you say, what it did, did Tulane lead you to where you are today? What I would say is, it's not a direct link, but had I not come here, then I probably wouldn't be living in Los Angeles, and I probably never would have made it into the movie business um, the way I did. Um, it gave me a different uh, level of confidence as a person and a desire to try new things and go different places, um, and that never would have happened. Um, I told the professor I wouldn't be able to think of one particular memory, but if I had to say what it was, it would be my senior year uh, diving into the street on St. Charles during the Zulu parade and coming up with a coconut. <laughs> By the way, one of my most significant uh, memories of Jimmy is him hazing me when I was a uh, freshman <laughs> pledge at CBT. True. <laughs> I think it's going to be clear I'm the cautionary tale, so <laughs> don't uh, mimic anything I did. Um, my, my story is kind of similar to Jimmy's in that uh, I transferred here, so I didn't have what which I kind of missed is the, um, the first year living in a dorm. I moved right to an apartment. But I was from, I grew up in St. Louis, Memphis, and Tulsa. So New Orleans was somewhat exotic to me. I mean, LA certainly was. I knew no one knew, no one in the entertainment business or you know that world just seemed so remote. Um, so coming here, it was just completely new. And I'll never, I was telling someone that uh, I stayed at the Columns Hotel because all of a sudden I got noticed that I was accepted. And it's like like that, I had to come down here. And I, I don't know, is Columns still? Oh, yeah. So I stayed there and before orientation, and this is kind of a lasting memory. I don't know if it's a good memory, but so they took us all out for orientation and uh, transfer orientation. And it was with some people, seniors usually, who were already here. And we all, of course, went to Pat O'Brien's and down in the corner. Uh, the guy who took us drove a pickup truck. Most of us were so drunk at the end of this is my first day in New Orleans <laughs> we're so drunk that we were passed out in the back of the pickup truck and they literally just pushed everyone out where their hotel or apartment or whatever it was so uh, I thought this is only gonna get better from there but uh, <laughs> uh, anyway that was my first experience with Tulane it did get better <laughs> these stories are getting tougher to beat <laughs> um, I came to Tulane from a weird perspective I grew up in Chicago and my thought was, I really hate the cold. So what is the warmest school I can get into? And Tulane turned out to be that school. I think what was amazing about being here is, as much as I love the school, and I still have a very fond place for it in my heart, is the city of New Orleans. And I love this city to this day. In fact, it continues to grow on me. Is that it kind of expanded my purview as to what the world was coming from a very uh, kind of bubble uh, environment growing up in the suburbs of Chicago and welcome to New Orleans. It, you know, this is not Kansas, Dorothy. And it 
it exposed me to the to the kind of culture and you know the food, the people, the the overall experience that I think it supported the idea of you know if I'm going to be a storyteller, which I always wanted to do since I was I don't know fifth sixth grade, that this is the kind of place to do it where you immerse yourself in the culture. Uh, and speaking of immersing in culture, the one story that comes to mind is freshman year. There was, now, I was here for four years. There was never a hurricane. There were a lot of tropical storms, but there was never a hurricane. Freshman year, there was a huge tropical storm, and McAllister flooded. And it was about four, right around Butler, if Butler is still called Butler. Uh, there was about four, four and a half feet of water, and myself and some of my new fraternity brothers thought it would be a great idea to go swimming down McAllister. And um, the fact that I didn't die from that, I think, is a, a testament to young intestinal fortitude. I actually grew up in New Orleans, um, you know, and um, grew up in a, in a house. The house that I was born into was a, a one-room 20 by 20 uh, kind of room. We lived there with my mother, father, uh, myself, and my uh, two, my brother and sister. You know, before we moved, uh, only cold water. You know, there was no hot water in the house. You know, in order to bathe and you know, do all those things, we had to heat it on the stove, which we were lucky to have. And you know, the, the restroom facility was a half block away, and it was an outhouse. Um, I, at age six or seven years old, you know, we moved into the projects, Calio housing projects. I mean, here in New Orleans. Thought I'd died and gone to heaven, and so because uh, we had a flush toilet, you know, and we didn't have to go outside, you know, in order to, you know, I mean, to do the deal. Um, get to Tulane, you know, I mean, all, all, all these years later, and it was, you know, I, I, like my second trip, you know, I mean, through the Looking Glass. Um, you know, I do have one memorable experience, and I don't know why I can't get this out of my head. I'll share, share that with you at the end. Um, but you know, I mean, more it was, uh, you know, I mean, the collective experience, uh, you know, I mean, coming from what was then, you know, 19. 67, uh, you know, I'm in a very different town, uh, New Orleans, than, you know, than it is today. Um, you know, I walked into an environment, you know, that, you know, still was made up of, you know, I mean, various constituencies. And so, but they were constituencies that I had, you know, never even, well, maybe imagined and so, but certainly had not experienced. Um, you know, got here, uh, you know, as a student athlete uh, stuff, and as it turns out, first African-American um, scholarship athlete, uh, you know, I mean, on campus. Um, <clears throat> there was one constituency, you know, I mean, I was a part of that, you know, that basketball team. My best memories, you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, some of the other guys were being a part of, you know, that team, you know, very Marine Corps-like environment, you know, and stuff, but you live and die, you know, I mean, for each other, you know, I mean, about victory. It was also a time of integration, you know, I mean, obviously, and stuff, and we had, out of 10,000 students throughout the university, 80 of us were African-American. Or were we black then? <laughs> No, we may have still been Negro then, <laughs> yeah, and stuff, and we evolved, you know, I mean, into you know, kind of those, you know, the, you know, those other things, and stuff. And then, you know, the third constituency was, and I happened in this accidentally, the theater department, you know, which was just incredible, you know. I mean, there were mindsets, you know, I mean, in, in, in all the others, you know, I mean, black power in one, you know, I mean, student athletes, well, back in the day, were relatively conservative, you know, the theater department was kind of all over the place and stuff, and just a wonderful, you know, entertaining environment. And I'll never forget my first experience, you know, I mean, in there when I walked into the theater department, was take, I, was, I was a psych major, doing a thing called psychodrama, walked into the theater department, and they immediately asked me to do a play. And so they're doing Brenton Bayhan's The Hostage, and they needed a gay Puerto Rican. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so I turned them down, you know, and, and stuff, and, 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 you know, to wait until the next year, you know what I mean, to, you know I mean, you, you, to do something. Uh, you know, but the bottom line is, you know I mean, my, my initial impression when I went in there was, and this is very simple, you know, was that the men and the women dressed in the same dressing room. You know, I said, this could be fun. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, I mean, much better than basketball. You know, you know, you know, you know let me tell you. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop now, but you know, and I'll tell you, there's, there's a singular experience. I mean, bottom line is, Tulane became a very nurturing environment. You know, I mean, where you know, I mean, it was an environment. You know, coming from you know, kind of a conservative or religious background, where all of a sudden, down the rabbit hole, on the other side of the looking glass, you know, there was an opportunity to explore all these different constituencies. Absolutely wonderful and nurturing. Uh, you know, I mean, Tulane essentially, you know, changed my life. And one of those moments, and I, you know, I'll share this with you, and I don't know why this is still in my head all these years. It's not something I've thought about you know, for this. It's just been there. 
I ended up in a, in a, in a, a, a lecture in uh, one of the auditoriums, you know, well, the auditorium directly across from here, that was given by a married couple you know, on the benefits of oral sex. What? I, I, I missed I miss, I miss that one. <laughs> but, but you can. I, I missed that class. There you go. You mean you can talk about this, you know, and and stuff, and, and you know, and I don't know why that's you know, that, you know that's still in my head, you know, but it, it is as a memorable. <laughs> oh, pardon me, memorable Tulane experience. Where are you gonna go from that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and you, I don't know where to go from that, but. Um, <laughs> I want to follow, and I think, Jimmy, you started talking about it a little bit. But think about, and, I, and talk to us a little bit about how you think Tulane prepared you for the life that you lead now. You want me to go first? Sure. Well, I mean, I did touch on it a little bit, um, and my wife and I were talking about it last night at dinner. The thing about this place is that it's, it's the most unique city in the United States. I don't think anybody can argue with that. And when you come here from someplace else, um, it doesn't adapt to you. You you adapt to it, and I'm I'm sure that's true now more than ever. Um, and I think the opportunity to come to a place where there are people from entirely different walks of life than the one I was used to growing up in New York. My roommate um, freshman year was from a very very small town in Louisiana. Um, I my guess is that. I was the first Jewish person that he had ever met. Um, he had, he was very religious. He had, uh, you know, a lot of uh, things all around our room that were very new to me. Um, but I do think that Louisiana and, and as a state, but New Orleans specifically, and some that Steve said, it, it's just the greatest city, and it's such a unifying force if you come here from somewhere else, and you just learn to be more open-minded and more willing to uh, try new things and go different places, and I think so, as I said, for me, coming here was the beginning of an evolution for me of wanting to live different places and do different things. Most of the people I grew up with you know, still live in the same part of New York and Long Island where I, where I grew up. And coming here was what told me that I knew I didn't want to do that and that I didn't want to go back there and there's nothing wrong with it, but it just wasn't for me. And it gave me the, the, the willingness and the desire to go to law school, you know, in Washington, D.C. And then from there, I, was, I worked uh, for a summer in Los Angeles as a, law, as a law clerk. And after one summer there, I just said, I'm going to give this a try. And I, I never could have known that it would work out the way it did for me. But that, that, that sense of wanting to learn and grow as a person, I completely attribute to my decision to come to school here. I have to redeem my drinking story. Yes, I don't think yes, the, the, the only idiot who told a drinking story. Um, no, but the similar, it, what I, before I got on the tangent, was growing up in St. Louis, Memphis, and Tulsa, everything, I'd never been exposed to the world that New Orleans and Tulane represented, really. I mean, we, we had come to New Orleans sometimes, but the people I was meeting, you know, from New York and L.A., you know, first-generation Cubans who lived in Miami, I mean, it was, just, it was just an exposure that someone who lived, and not in a bubble necessarily, but just my background was, you know, kind of small. And this just opened up a whole, you know, round of opportunity, and again, I don't think I would have ever ended up in LA um, or in this business if it weren't for here. I would have thought it was, again, foreign and some closed club that you had to be a member of, and it it literally emboldened me, I, and, and that's probably the one thing I saw. I don't think any of us have a similar story necessarily from our experience at the school, but um, I would say that there there is a kind of boldness that it kind of allowed me to, you know, take on or take some risk or adventure into you know, things that I, I know I never would have had I gone to, you know, University of Oklahoma or something. No offense. <laughs> I think that, you know, if, if getting more specific about, you know, a liberal arts education is that I had great teachers. I had teachers that allowed us to fail. And, you know, we work in a business where if you're batting three out of ten in any sort of deal, deal making, getting stuff done, you know, you're hitting major league all-star numbers. And so there's a lot of failure in, in the entertainment business. And being here in the liberal arts program where teachers would push us, and I didn't have the greatest grades, but I was always pushed by them to apply myself as hard and as heartily as I could. And, you know, 
there was a lot of, you know, I remember I had a great English teacher freshman year, and he just, he broke all the rules. You know, it, was, it wasn't just having class outside. It was, do, I want you to write this paper, but I don't want you to do it in this normal sense. I want you to go out and sit in this place and talk to people and incorporate these ideas and bring it back, and I don't care if it's one page or 30 pages. Notions like that, and there were several teachers like that. Now granted, there are certain classes that are like by the book, and you have to follow them, and when I didn't, I got the grades to prove it. But I found, uh, you know, the liberal arts program here was really, again, it allowed me to expand my mind in a city that was already greatly expanding my mind from the little world that I had come from. For me, uh, yeah, I mean, it was the fact that, yeah, I mean, once I got here, um, you know, there were, there were no, it was an exploration, you know, and so if you know, I mean, again, coming from an environment where, you know, everybody expected to get to an answer, uh, you know, and stuff that, you know, I mean, and, and I imagine this is, is, is true of college, you know, I mean, in general, but I think certainly, you know, very specifically, you know, I mean, the Tulane at the time, you know, which was, you know, on the verge of change, you know, I mean, as was, you know, I mean, the rest of the world. Not necessarily the city of New Orleans, you know, but Tulane certainly inside of that city. And you know, I, mean, I absolutely agree with Stephen. You know, one of the things that was very important in, you know, in liberal arts was, you know, I mean, it was an, an opportunity to learn to gamble. You know, and, and, and Hollywood is very much a gambler's town. Uh, you know, so the people who make it the furthest are the people that are willing to go out to the edge of the thinnest limb. You know, I mean, it you know it really is as simple as that. You know, and then have a social network as well. You know, I mean, you know, there's some other components. You know, but it's important to have that capacity. And so if timid people, you know, I mean, don't do well in life, you know, I mean, for one, but, yeah, you know, I think particularly in Hollywood, uh, you know, they don't do well uh, at, at all. And, uh, you know, I learned, uh, you know, I mean, to be, or at least make an attempt to be competitive, uh, you know, I mean, from liberal arts in this environment, uh, you know, I mean, just having to go find it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely grew up in a bubble also. I was on Long Island, and uh, I was telling my son this morning that I remember the first three months here uh, calling home five times a day begging to come home because I couldn't believe how radically different the place was, you know, from New Orleans, from uh, Long Island to New Orleans. But as everybody here has been saying, it pushed me out of my comfort zone, and I had this very strong feeling that if I didn't get out when I went to college, that I would never get out. And uh, And there's no doubt that sort of, you know, breaking a very, very close sort of family circle and coming out to this place that I'd never been before gave me the, you know, the, the, the confidence and the courage by the end of this journey here to think about anything that I wanted to do. Um, and the Hollywood, the, the, the thought of Hollywood initially was not even a thought because I thought it was a nepotistic business and, you know, how do you get from Tulane there? Um, but the way this school inspires you to think about anything, uh, you know, really made that a, uh, a tangible dream. I want to turn a little bit to talk about what it is that you all are doing now. You're in, you're in the industry, have been in the industry for 20, 30 years at this point, 30-ish years. Talk to me about, from your particular vantage point, from what it is that you do, where do you see the industry going, given all the technological changes and all of the changes in the way things get monetized? Where's the industry going, and what do our students need to know who want to do it? And we remind them of what it is that it is that you do. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we we, we you know one of the, we all do different things, and we all um, unfortunately I haven't had the privilege to work with with Harold, but I'm aware of very aware of Harold's work, but. The, the, the four of us here uh, actually interact with each other a lot. I'm a talent representative, uh, so specifically what I do is I represent artists. I happen to represent uh, filmmakers uh, is my specialty and, uh, and creator showrunners for television. Um, and as, a, as an agent for 25 years, which I did before I, I, I became a manager, it was basically everything from career guidance to uh, negotiating their contracts, um, putting out fires, a lot of hand-holding, uh, and, and putting together movies, too. Uh, there's, there's not, as I've now become a manager-producer, I, I find that I've been doing everything that I've been doing for the last 25 years. 
Uh, only now I also get to take on a, uh, a producer function, which I'm learning and, uh, and really having the greatest time of my life. But the, uh, to me, the, 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 you know, there's been a radical change in the way stories are told uh, from the time that I started in the William Morris mailroom in 1984 uh, to now. Um, you know, when I got into the business, I was a, uh, I was a student of film of the 70s, having grown up in the 70s and, and coming of age with uh, everything from Mean Streets to uh, Jaws and Close Encounters, you know, and of course Star Wars. Those were the things that really, uh, uh, you know, inspired me to get into the business um, and, you know, sort of what people like to talk about in Hollywood is that that you know that whole sort of Jaws Star Wars transition is the thing that changed Hollywood from being the Hollywood of um, you know some of the grittier films of the 70s you know like Dog Day Afternoon or Prince of the City or or Mean Streets to being sort of this these uh, you know tentpole. Uh, you know, effects type movies that have slowly but surely sort of taken over many of the things that I got inspired to being in the film business for. Um, there's a lot of excitement being involved with those kind of films and I've been part of those kind of, I mean, my, my share of those films, but um, what I think, and, and Jimmy could probably speak more to this because he runs a studio, um, I sort of feel like people are getting a little burned out on the sort of effects Latin um, films and that what people really want is emotional storytelling. Um, there were a whole bunch of films last year that were nominated for Oscars that I thought and hope uh, is a step in the right direction where the business is going. Movies like, you know, The Fighter, movies like uh, um, uh, uh, The King's Speech. Um, movies that are not necessarily uh, that 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 our industry today looks like look, looks at as though they're art films. When in the 70s and the 80s they were very sort of mainstream movies, but I think because of the times that we're dealing with and what people are looking to go to films or watch television to escape for is to have more of a sort of uh, reflection of a human experience than be bombarded by effects. Um, because my own personal taste, as much as I'm involved in a lot of those films, it, uh, it just becomes mind-numbing. And the things that really inspire me are just, you know, great human stories that have a lot of drama, that make you laugh, that scare the hell out of you, that, um, but that ultimately you sort of have this journey and experience with whoever that character is that you can identify with, and you come out feeling like, you know, you either want to walk right back in the theater and have that ride again, or feeling like you learned something from it. That's where I'm hoping it heads. Well, I hope you're not right about the special effects stuff, because I'll be looking for a job in a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's room for everything. I'm just going to work backwards a little bit um, on the question, just in terms of, uh, of what you guys are doing and the part of your life you're embarking on, and whether or not you need to do something specific in order to maybe one day be sitting up here talking to a, a group of students. Um, I'm a strong believer that um, the liberal arts education that you're getting here or at any other university in the country is a, is a great way um, to start your adult life and you should pursue that and the things you're interested in and the things that inspire you and not worry at all about what job that is or isn't gonna lead to down the road. That doesn't mean that if you come to college knowing you wanna be a doctor or knowing that you wanna be a lawyer that you shouldn't focus your energies in that space, but there's nothing I did anywhere along the way that would have changed where I am today. In fact, I think that had I been more specific, had I said I really want to do this, I want to go to Los Angeles and work in the movie business, my strong belief is it never would have happened. Um, I didn't even move to LA to work in the movie business. I fell into it when I left my law firm and took a job that someone told me about at a lunch one day. So I do think that you have a long time um, to make these decisions, you should enjoy what you're doing, and you should do the things that, that inspire you. Um, in terms of our business and where it's going, and you know what David said, 
we are at a, an incredibly um, interesting, fascinating, um, and concerning time in the business if you work in a movie studio and you are in the business of making movies that sometimes cost north of $200 million, cost $50 million or more to market and distribute. Um, and we live in a world where all of you have all different kinds of things that take your interest, and you don't have to go to the movie theater to see the movie if you don't want. Um, when I started in the business, it was just after uh, VHS. You know, video had, had come on the market. People were sure they were going to kill the movie business, um, and they didn't. Um, now, here, 25 years later, um, we're really on the verge of, a, of an entirely new model for how the consumer consumes movies. Um, and there's a, you know, a strenuous debate going on about whether uh, people do or don't care about seeing it in the movie theater, um, about whether they are willing to wait. If they are, will they pay for it? Um, do all of you watch on your um, iPod or iPad or some tiny screen on your computer when you have a big TV next door or where you have a movie theater down the street? And are you going to go get in your car and go pay to do it? We at the studio believe that all of these experiences can coexist. It's figuring out how to do it in a way that all the different special interests that are in our business can be serviced. And who's going to give it to them, and how are you going to give it to them? Um, what, what's gone on, the revolution that's gone on, um, you know, is it's, it's a phenomenal uh, change in, in how consumers um, consume movies. We, we actually feel that the movie business um, will always have a place um, in, the, in the consumer market because Movies just have this thing about them that people love. They talk about them. Um, they, when they're passionate about them, they go and, and the first night and stand in line. All those things that excite you. The issue is whether it's a one-size-fits-all model or whether we should be figuring out how to make certain movies for certain rep, for certain platforms and certain movies for others. Um, if you're going to go see um, uh, a Transformers movie, whether you whether that's your speed or not, if you're going to go see that movie, I assume most people want to go see that in a movie theater. It's made for that. If you're going to go see The King's Speech, maybe not. Um, I'll just tell you a very quick story. I don't know if it got picked up here. It was very big news recently. Our studio tried to do a test, and it was only it was a very very limited test. Um, our owner is now Comcast which is the largest cable provider in the, in, the, in the country. And obviously, they bought the studio because they want to own the content that we, that we create. We wanted to do a, a test in two markets, just in Portland and in, um, in Atlanta. Uh, we have a movie called Tower Heist that's opening in a couple of weeks. It's not a pitch, but it's a great movie. Um, <laughs> Uh, ben Stone and Andy Murphy, um, uh, and what we said to the what we said was we were going to make it available in your home on on VOD. Uh, it was going to cost sixty dollars. It was going to be available three weeks after the theatrical window, so the movie could still be in theaters, um, and you could buy it, and then you would have to watch it within forty eight hours, and it would be available for two weeks. Um, the point of doing it was to figure out whether. They are, these, these businesses are cannibalistic or whether they can coexist. Do people go to movies and watch it and so they don't care? People who are never going to go and they'll go buy it even though, and we put the price where we put it for a specific reason which was to say people are going to pay $60 and stay home, we're never going to the movie in the first place. And so we try to do it in the most limited way possible and the theater owners said they wouldn't play our movie if we did this. So they have the right to do that. They own the theaters, and they don't have to play our movie. So what they were saying was, we want to keep things the way they are. We want people to come to the theater. We don't want it available another way. And we were saying, we want to figure out whether these two businesses can coexist. So that's what's happening right now. You have, you have very differing interests, and we're all trying to figure out how to do this using the technology that's available um, to, to the consumer and give them our product in, uh, in any way we can. So these are the kinds of interesting things that are going on. It's going to continue to grow, but five years from now, it's going to be a completely different marketplace than it is today, and it's, it's an incredibly interesting time in our business. Um, in terms of, I mean, I, I'm on a different side than these guys a little bit. They're actually with the nuts and bolts making of the movies. I mean, one thing I will say, working from a big 
a piece of a big conglomerate that has um, a movie studio. I, I had this debate with somebody recently, and they were saying, "Why does Hollywood just make crap?" And you know, and it's such an oversimplification, and it's not true. I don't. Th I mean, it's true. It's subjective, but it's kind of like a portfolio. I mean, we, where I work, made Avatar, um, Alvin and the Chipmunks. Don't laugh. Um, and Black Swan. In order to make a Black Swan, you have to have an avatar, an Alvin and Chipmunks, and to take a risk on an avatar, you gotta have lots of Alvin and Chipmunks. So, um, <laughs> so that, that's one thing. I, I think this business gets oversimplified in that regard. Um, in terms of what I do, and just to back up to explain what I do, because um, my family doesn't understand it. Um, uh, I, I fell into Hollywood. I actually thought I was going to go to law school. I ended up going to New York, and I, when I decided not to go to law school, I was starting and editing um, healthcare magazines, so as far away as possible. Somebody related to that knew somebody in LA who worked at Variety, the editor of Variety. I ended up going to Variety, and I was a reporter there for um, several years. Um, so I've seen it. I've been an observer of the business, and it's actually how I met David, and I think it was heated the first time we met, actually, but uh, then we became colleagues on the other side. But then I, after my journalism career kind of you know, ended, I went to this side. And the w biggest thing I see change-wise facing, and I handled communications for Fox, so I don't do the publicity on the individual movies, um, but, you know, like right now, I was talking to these guys, um, that zoo, or the, the guy in Ohio, who just let the animals out, and we have a movie coming out called We Bought a Zoo. So today I'm fielding calls about that, you know, and, and what that means for our movie and stuff like that. So it's, it's I handle business related communications publicity, but not specifically to put in an actor, you know, in an interview uh, with a reporter. But the biggest change I see from what I do, and I think affecting all these, my, my job is relatively new to Hollywood. A lot of these studios haven't had someone like um, in these roles, I'm probably second generation, third generation uh, for Fox. Um, but it came about, the shop came about, it used to be the slick suit guy who came in the back gate and, you know, would, you know, pretend marry um, actors or, you know, something like that um, in the 40s, 50s and, and before that. Now we're all owned by conglomerates. Now instead of talking down to the press and telling the press what you want them to write about you, it is a horizontal field with new media, social uh, media, um, you know, who calls himself a reporter? I mean, I was asking someone if there's a journal, I was an English major here, but um, everyone's a reporter now. I mean, you guys can go blog, text, Twitter right now about, you know, the idiotic things I'm saying or about a movie you just walked out of, and instantly that's gonna have more effect, to be honest, probably than a variety story will, um, and a more immediate one. And I think it's affecting all of our businesses more than any of us even want to re recognize um, because now it's a conversation we have to have. And Hollywood, I think, traditionally has been somewhat elitist in that, you know, it was, it's a cool place to work. So, you know, you, and you got in this club that did seem, you know, closed. And uh, you're, you're making movies that the world loves and, you know, the influence and the stars and it seems glamorous and everything. So you could, you know, used to say this is what our story is. It's not that way anymore. I mean, literally, a 14-year-old kid in Tulsa can, you know, a few tweets of after seeing your movie can really, you know, affect, you know, its outcomes. And there's, as Jimmy said, there's millions and millions of dollars um, being spent on these movies. And so the changes in marketing, the changes in how we communicate, you know, about our movies, about our studios, you know, even last, like last night, I, I having the conversation with some guy, at a restaurant, um, he was the one actually saying all we made was crap. But that, in a way, was probably as influential as me having a conversation with a, a reporter from the Wall Street Journal because this guy's going to probably tell more people. Um, and it's it's literally a more grassroots. It, it's like a reversal from being uh, top down to a grassroots way of approaching it. You know, just. Jumping in on what everybody else is saying is, you know, the, the, we, there is a sea change that's going on right now. And, you know, specifically to what it is that you want to get involved in when you come to Hollywood. I, I come to it from a writer, producer, director standpoint. I, I always knew I wanted to be in the film business. I, as a poli-sci major here, even though I considered the idea of staying here and going into local government, I knew that I wanted to make movies. I just always knew it. 
And it was very simple. You went to Hollywood. I'm oversimplifying this, but you went to Hollywood. You wrote a script, or you 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 went to film school, and you made a short film, or what have you. And then hopefully someone would notice that you have talent, assuming you have talent, and you start your way into the process. Whether it's you're a, a director's assistant or you work at, uh, at, at, at an agency in a mail room or what have you. There's a variety of different ways, but that was the way to go about it when we started this. We're in such a different world right now where the interesting thing I find about Hollywood is that it's never had a barrier to entry. And you know that's why anybody that you walk up to in Los Angeles who gives you their business card says, I'm a producer who also happens to be your waiter, uh, you know, it's there is no barrier to entry. What's fascinating right now is the whole notion of how the internet works and the fact that so many talented young people are being discovered from the internet that are being plucked out and literally given the opportunities that none of us, I believe, ever had because we weren't able to sort of democratize our work the way that young people today are able to do that. You make a great short film and someone, anybody here on this panel takes a look at it and says, wow, this person has some really extraordinary talent. And you shoot your way up through several levels right up to the top where you're meeting with the heads of studios or big agents and, and big managers and people that are decision makers within Hollywood. So. It is, I think that it's a really exciting time to be coming to Hollywood, to be making films, to be, and, and it's the same thing if you decide that you want to be a writer or even a producer, you can go online and you can find, you can be the one that finds that great filmmaker and says, all right, filmmaker, you and I are going to walk into David Lahner's office and we're going to tell him after his company has called us and said, we're interested and tell him what, how we're going to exploit this, and I mean exploit in the best sense of the word, this seven minute movie and turn it into a real feature film or a television show or, you know, the truth is, is that and they haven't figured out the pro, they, they meaning us and they had the, the proper business model as to how to properly and successfully monetize the internet has, th that's still very much a work in progress, but it will happen. It's not an if it happens, it will happen. It's just, it's a matter of people trying to figure out how to best do it because it is very much the wild west out there. But the opportunities are, they're, they're, are, they're numerous. And if you've got the drive and the determination to do it, there is, you will at least, I believe, and if you, you have some talent, you will at least have the shot. You will be given the shot that, uh, that perhaps you end up being that writer or director or producer. I mean, I can tell you real quickly is that I was fortunate enough, I went to graduate school, I went to film school, which was the only real avenue to make movies except for, you know, if you were, went off and paid the thousands of dollars for equipment and film and locations and such. So I had the luxury of having all of that supplied for me by Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles. And my entree was, fortunately, I made a short film that won an Academy Award for my student short. And the, the world opened up for me. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of opportunities for any filmmaker, again, meaning director, producer, actor, writer, what have you, to win their own version of an Academy Award, which is people noticing what it is, the content that you're creating. And I find that incredibly exciting and really encouraging, so. Well, this is deep. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I, you know, I mean, and you know, from the first words that David said, you know, I mean, talking, and, and, and Jimmy, you know, I mean, everybody giving it, you know, kind of an overview of uh, what the business is like. <clears throat> I've got more of what I, would consider an underview, um, you know. I mean, but you know, I mean, going back to the beginning, I mean, you know, I want Mean Streets back as well. Um, you know, I mean, I want movies, you know, I mean, that you know, that, that make people feel something, you know, and that's personal. You know, the business, you know, I mean, for me, I mean, as an actor, as a performer, got very boring. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, as as time went on, and so because we were just out there saying words that, that you know, for me were meaningless, and we we're making a lot of money, and we we're going home, you know, and stuff. So, and for me, that's not the movie business that I never wanted to be a part of anyhow. Um, you know, I mean, I was a very reluctant actor uh, and stuff, and I think, you know, I mean, whatever modicum of success I had was because I 
said no a lot, didn't want to do it, you know, and so unless it was, you know, something that was exciting, you know, that, 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 that had something that, that gave me enjoyment, you know, political enjoyment, social enjoyment, you know, as a part of the process. You know, those are the things that were important to me and they started going away. Uh, I got re reinvigorated, you know, I mean, as a technology, uh, you know, it started changing, you know, because I think there became another opportunity, you know, to engage, uh, you know, people who had not been where we had all been, uh, you know, I mean, essentially before. But, you know, in the process, the other thing that I noticed, uh, you know, because I actually started off in this business behind the scenes as a cameraman, uh, you know, and stuff, so, you know, I had a whole different evolution informed what I did as an actor, you know, because there I am doing studio camera, hearing what, you know, the crew is saying about the actors, you know, and stuff, so that, you know, I had a different reality, and stuff, you know, when, when, when I, you know, first, uh, you know, went in front of the camera. But through the process, I mean, you know, as the technology evolved, uh, you know, I mean, you realize that there are people that get very facile on manipulating the te technology, but lose track of what the stories are, you know, I mean, what the theater is, you know, what the evolution of, of, of storytelling is, going back and, you know, I don't want to say they, they, you're the Greeks, because we can talk about the Chinese and the Africans, you know, I mean, as well, you know, when, 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 you get to, when you get to storytelling. But I think that part, you know, I mean, is sometimes missing in commercial Hollywood, and I wish it were back, and I, you know, I mean, but I think there's another opportunity. And the last thing I'll say is that it feels for me, I mean, you know, as a stage actor, you know, and stuff, I mean, I often you know, answer the question about what is difference, different between acting, performing, you know, in front of a live audience and performing, you know, on film. And, you know, and I think there is a difference in the performance, but I, I don't think that there's a difference in the way the audience is affected, you know, I mean, or how the or how audience evaluates, you know, I mean, what, you know, what they're seeing. I think both, you know, I mean, are social mediums. You know, and stuff. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, as, as, as I watch, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, as a member of the Academy, you have to watch all these movies, you know, I mean, on DVD, you know, just to get enough to, you know, be able to make critical decisions. One of the things that I notice is that I may not actually be making a good critical decision if I sit down and watch that movie by myself and make an evaluation. You know, it's very different if I've got my kids or grandkids or, you know, I mean, another kind of audience in the room because I'm watching a movie and, and also interpreting how other people are appreciating it so it becomes a total, you know, I mean, a, a part of the, you know, the, the, the entire total experience. You know, so my take, all that to say, you know, you know what, what I'm focused on, you know, I mean, these days is one storytelling, you know, I mean, how to get you guys, you know, I mean, who understand the technology to actually understand how to tell stories. You know, and I think that comes from collaborations on different level, levels. And I think short form, you know, is one of those levels. And so, but I also think that even in short form, it's a collective, or it needs to be a collective experience. And so, and maybe it's not movie theaters, you know, and stuff. So, you know, maybe it's something else. Uh, you know, don't want to give away what, what I'm even thinking about that. But you know, I mean, the bottom line is, I think when people are together, you know, the experience of watching movies is is a very different. Uh, you know, experience. I love traditional Hollywood. You know, I, you know, I, mean, I lost, you know, got lost, uh, you know, I mean, to some extent on the special effects stuff, uh, you know, as well, you know, but I'll watch them, you know, I mean, bottom line is there is some enjoyment. It's not the same enjoyment, uh, you know, that, you know, we, we've gotten traditionally, you know, and stuff and that I want, you know, I mean, I want to walk out of that theater having felt something and not just being blasted by something. Uh, you know, I think that's critically important. You know, so I guess the message, you know, the thing that I'm saying is, is you know, to you guys is, is that, you know, those partnerships, you know, I mean, the understanding, um, you know, I mean, of, of, of what the tradition is, um, um, you know, I mean, is very important, you know, I mean, to, you know, where you're going to move, you know, in the, in, 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 in the future. And, and my, my advice would be to move, you know, where you feel. You know, I just want to bring up one quick thing about the, uh, you know, the, the nature of these big, uh, the titanic, literally and metaphorically speaking movies, is that I think that they can accomplish both. Uh, I was moved to tears by watching Avatar. I thought it was, uh, frankly, and I loved The Hurt Locker. I thought it was an extraordinary piece of filmmaking. And yet I was really disappointed that Avatar didn't win Best Picture because I thought it was an incredible genesis of technology that we had never seen before with extraordinary storytelling and the technology serviced the storytelling and so it's not to say that great big movies can't move you it's just to say 
as Harold is saying, is that to incorporate the nature of great storytelling and characters that are relatable and, and that, that speak of the universal themes and truths that we all can relate to on a variety of different levels. That's what's most important is to not forget the story in the storytelling. Because a lot of these big movies, we may get frustrated by them, but again, there are some terrific movies. Titanic was another, in my mind's eye, a, a, a terrific movie. I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see Battleship because I know there's a phenomenal director aboard who, is, it, who tells, if you guys have ever seen Friday Night Lights, which is a phenomenal TV, store, uh, TV show, Pete Berg is one of the great working directors in Hollywood. And if anybody can pull off such a you know, magnum opus, I think that he's the guy to do it. So there's a free plug for your movie. You yeah. <laughs> very nice, yeah. very nice, Steve. I hope you're right. I have lots of questions, but I know you all have some as well. If you, I'm gonna ask them more and more, but if you can come and line up right here to this microphone to ask them questions, because they wanna hear from their alums instead of hearing from me. And I'm gonna ask them to give the best piece of advice to our students, either that someone gave you or that you can give them for those wanting to pursue these industries broadly construed. And as they do that, if you can walk to the microphone to begin ask it, asking your questions. But you can talk now. Okay. okay. I mean, listen, I, 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 I think everybody said a version of this. You just gotta be, to really make it in, in, in Hollywood, you gotta love what it is you're either gonna be part of as a filmmaker or what, from, my, from what I do, uh, selling. And, and I, I, I can tell you that when I, uh, I had this moment in my junior year abroad, I was at Tel Aviv University, and, um, and my uncle, who I had had a, uh, you know, always an argumentative relationship with, sort of got in my face and said, what are you gonna do with your life? My dad was a, uh, a metals trader, it's not really what I wanted to do. Again, I wasn't really thinking about the movie business. As, a, as an option, and, uh, and he really got me going, because here I was a junior, I was actually having the greatest time of my life, and now all of a sudden I was about to be a senior, and I really had to start thinking about it. And what that year abroad actually helped me to do was think about what it is that I love, what it is that I am passionate about. And when I really dug deep, I realized, you know, I was a kid who grew up on television, on movies, and on music, and I was a dreamer, and um, and when I sort of sift away everything about what I can really get passionate about, that's really what it was. And that led me to do a bunch of research. I was, I was, uh, I was DJing at WTUL, and I would always read Variety and Billboard. And uh, as I started reading that, and then I started reading books about the business, I started realizing that a lot of the people who were my heroes at the time had all started in the William Morris mailroom. And that became sort of that lightning bolt that was the point of entry that I could start. Um, and, uh, and I sort of channeled every source of energy and uh, relationships that I had on campus to say, do you guys know anybody who can help me get an interview in the William Morris mailroom? That's really what I want to do. And about 50 inquiries in, it turned out somebody knew somebody who knew somebody that sort of started to get the ball rolling. Um, but that sort of spark and realization that happened because of my experience here, that happened because I was so inspired by the friends that I had who really did figure out exactly what they wanted to do, um, you know, sort of got me to that point. But it really is about, you know, you're, you're in this moment right now, you, you know, anywhere from 18 to 22 to, you know, even if you're in graduate school, you can do anything. And, um, and when I moved out to Hollywood and I started it and I, you know, I didn't know anybody and I, I was at the Oakwood apartment complex and, you know, I literally said, I will sweep the floors. I will deliver packages all hours of the night. It didn't matter to me. In my mind, if David Geffen and Ron Meyer all started in the mailroom without even a high school degree, then that was good enough for me. And I was going to do it with a good attitude, and candidly, the day that I got into the William Morris mailroom, I still remember as one of the great days of my Hollywood life. I, I, I couldn't believe that I had gotten my foot in the door, and the rest was going to be up to me, and you know, I gladly shoveled whatever crap they asked me to shovel, because you know, I was in the William Morris mailroom, and I got my foot into Hollywood, and, um, you know, and I was grateful, and I mean, I think that that to me is like, you just, you, and, and, and it was all part of the fact that what else would I want to do when I was 
I remember being in the valley once because I didn't know Los Angeles and I was trying to drop off a package to somebody and I knew that the late great Ed Lamato, who unfortunately died last year, who was one of the great Hollywood talent agents, was going to have my head if I didn't drop that script off to his client at that time. And uh, I remember doing this primal scream in the car, like, what am I doing? I'm a Tulane graduate. What am I doing here in the middle of the night? And, and then I really thought, well, what else would I want to do? What other business would I want to be in? So um, anyway, you just got to be passionate about it. I'm not surprised to hear you had a plan, David. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have one. But I, will, I tell you, I do remember um, when I was a young lawyer in Los Angeles, I once went to see David when he was a young agent at ICM. Um, and he had this pretty big, fancy office. And I was just, I was really impressed. And I thought, God, you know, how did you get, how did you do that? How did you get to do that? And, and, and now I know how. And what he described is a, it is a rite of passage. It is something that is true that you have, um, you know, today people with, uh, you know, with JDs from Harvard and MBA from, MBAs from Stanford who are working in the mailroom at a talent agency. So you got to really, really want it badly if you are uh, smart enough to get into Tulane. I don't know about anybody else here, but I would not get in today. Um, and that's a great thing about the school. And, and I, I, w I do want to say um, how impressed I am with where the university finds itself today. And obviously, uh, you know, what President Cowan and, and his administration have done here, uh, I think, is, is beyond impressive, especially uh, with, you know, with what happened, you know, in post-Katrina. Um, and I think that's the way it should be. You want, you want your school to grow and be better so that it's a place that you couldn't have gotten into if you were trying to now. And so, you know, I have a lot of admiration for all of you who are here um, and who did well enough to get in. Um, you know, my advice would be um, do something else first. Um, you know, don't, your first job is not gonna be your last job. Um, and if you think that this is something you wanna do, don't feel like you have to rush to go do it. And, um, and, and, and do things that will make you grow as a person so that when you do go to do it, it'll make you more attractive. Um, when I went to first work at the studio in, in 1992, I was the most junior lawyer at the company and I had no experience in the movie business at all. Um, and it didn't matter. They actually liked the fact that I was just uh, a lawyer who had worked at a big law firm and I had that degree and it has always been something that I've been proud of and I think that um, it g gave me a way of thinking about, um, about business. Um, and I think I still use it now when I make deals. Um, and it's so, so, you know, and even now when I hire lawyers to come work at the studio, it doesn't matter to me what they've been doing. In fact, I'm more likely to hire someone who's worked at a big law firm as a corporate lawyer or a real estate lawyer um, than I am someone who's been working, uh, you know, as, at a boutique law firm who's only done the thing that we do. I think, what you, I think we all bring to our jobs our life experience um, as well as our career experience. And so, you know, even if you have a fascination with the business, even if it's something you've always wanted to do, um, don't be in too big of a rush and, and try and find things that will make you more attractive to the people who are going to want to hire you. And yes, if you want to be an agent at a, at a, at a talent agency, you're going to start from the bottom anyway. So maybe you would want to just come out and start right away. But there's a reason why the agencies hire people who have JDs or MBAs into their training program and not people who just graduated from college. So, so get, get, get as much education and as much learning as you can while you can. Stay in school, go to graduate school, um, and, then, and then figure out what you want to do advice if a guy comes to pick you up in a pickup truck to drink don't <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree with Jimmy I, I'm obviously not the most focused person on the panel as far as um, career advice but um, I think there's there's I mean one, one observation I have about everyone on here is that um, um, while they may have fallen into Hollywood or gotten in on purpose um, from the onset uh, there are stereotypes in Hollywood that live up to each of these. An agent is a certain. None of these guys are what those stereotypes are. They're, I don't know if that's the passion that's separating them. I don't know if it's the. Um, but, but there's a very human. I mean, David, I obviously know, uh, as I said. But there's a there's there's something I, I'm just trying to say. You can glean from this group that there's a common kind of humanity to them um, that I don't see, especially as an observer and now working in it, um, is normally the case. Um, as far as advice, I would say 
one thing that I, I'm I kind of am proud of is I sampled a lot of stuff because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, um, it's how I fell into journalism. You know, again, I was an English major. Didn't think I'd ever be going to journalism, but c kind of fell into it. Really liked it. Really liked the autonomy of it. Really liked the um, the ability to learn a lot of different things. Um, and it's kind of what I do now. I deal with the legal side. I deal with the you know the press, the you know the, the production. So every side. So I kind of I feel it. it set me up for this, but I, you know, I did healthcare marketing before I did a healthcare magazine. And I think the one thing that Tulane gave me was, as I said before, that kind of emboldened me to try all these things, as opposed to just go straight into law school, go straight, you know, it, it opened up all these roads that I was able to experiment, some that I was a abysmal failure at or some, that, you know, but at least opened that up to where, you know. I have a slightly different track, though I will say that you know what what Jimmy is saying, what everybody here has said is uh, true, is that see the world, experience things, create a world for yourself that you have as many points of view and perspectives as possible. So when you finally hone your own point of view, you're not coming at it narrowly. You've incorporated a variety of life lessons, as it were. I always wanted to make movies and television shows since I was a little kid, and I knew what I wanted to do. Now, how I was going to get there was a whole other story. So what I'm going to say is kind of counterintuitive, and your parents would probably have my head for this, is have no plan B. Uh, if I had had a plan B, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I, uh, I had some early success in my career. Um, I didn't know how to handle it. I wasn't a junkie or anything like that. I just didn't know. I didn't understand how Hollywood works, and I just ignorantly or arrogantly or naively sat by the phone thinking that I was going to be able to just pick up people were going to call and say, hey, Stephen, come direct this movie at Fox. And it didn't quite work that way. And so I went through a fallow period, a very long fallow period, period where I ran up extraordinary credit card debt, where I borrowed from everybody that would lend me money, where I had my parents very worried that, you know, where was my life going? And, you know, even they who were so supportive tried to stage an intervention, go get another job, go get a job. And what I realized is that if I had done that, and I had a very specific thing happen to me about eight, nine years ago where I finally was going to capitulate, and I went to a, uh, a real estate firm, a, a big corporate, uh, you know, commercial real estate firm. And I walked in, and it was, it was like a scene out of, I don't know, maybe Beetlejuice, where everybody I saw there were producers and writers and ADs and actors, I mean, people I knew, and I thought, I'm having some sort of parallel life vision right here. It's like, clearly, I, I, I've kind of reached the end of my rope, and I go into a guy's office who was an actor. I don't know, he was on the Brady Bunch or it's something. And he says, dude, two years here, you'll be making $400,000 a year. And I thought, well, that's about 400000 more than I'm making right now. So I thought, all right, you know, I could sell commercial real estate. And I walked out of the building, and within 10 minutes, I thought to myself, they could pay me $4 million a year or $40 million a year. It's not what I want. It's not what I love. If I can make $10,000 a year doing what I love, that to me is living the life that I want to live. So I have always lived by the notion, no plan B, because this business is so, it's fun, it's incredible. I feel like the luckiest guy in the world that I can actually do something that I get paid for and continue to be able to do something but you, you find yourself in a, in a place where there's so much competition for so few spots, relatively speaking, is that if you are working, I don't say don't go out and support yourself like I foolishly didn't, but still, you find yourself competing against so many other people that if you have a plan B in your head, you should go do it. Because it, this business, as everybody on this panel has said, is driven by passion. Your, your career will be driven by passion and that bulldoggedness that says, I'm going to do this come hell or high water. So just don't tell your parents I said that. So. 
Yeah, I, boy, I, I, I really want to be brief with this, but um, bottom line is, I went to when I went to Hollywood. I, you know, I, mean, I, had, I actually had a notion that uh, you know things politically, uh, you know, might be able to be affected by the kinds of things that we're doing. You know, I come out of Agitprop Theater, you know, in 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 New Orleans. You know, it's supposed to. You know, post Tulane, and you know we're doing all kinds of you know crazy political stuff, and and you know getting shot at by the Klan, and run, you know all kinds of crazy things were happening, and, and and it looked like Hollywood was an opportunity, you know, to have a a, a different, broader, uh, you know, voice. Hollywood had other ideas, you know, and, and stuff. I mean, you know, that's you know Hollywood does some of that, but that's not what Hollywood is about. You know, I mean, that essentially is not the bottom line. You know, but I think, you know, I mean, there is, you know, another opportunity. I mean, I've never lost the passion. And so I mean, what the passion was is that, you know, when I was your age, you know, I mean, essentially I'm looking at movies and television and not seeing anybody, not only that, that didn't look like me, but didn't represent, you know, I mean, you know, what I felt. You know, and when they tried to represent, you know, I mean, my reality, you know, I said, what the hell are y'all talking about? You know, that, you know, this reality is nothing, you know, like it's being portrayed. So I thought that Hollywood was an opportunity, and to some extent, it was. But again, pendulum swing. You know, I, mean, I think you have the same you know, idea. We were talking earlier. This feels like a time gone by. You know, I mean, I was here in the 60s you know, and, 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 and early 70s. It's starting to feel like that again. You know, I mean, texturally, you know, I mean, for me personally, this could be 1968. You, know, you have an opportunity you know, I mean, with a whole different you know, set of tools you know, I mean, to at least you know, tell what's personal inside you. You know, let everybody know, you know, once again, what you feel. You know, I mean, I think that's very important. You know, you have that opportunity. You know, marry some, yourself with somebody, you know, who understands the structure and go out and tell your story. And then the last thing, I, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'll say is that, you know, the, the thing that's, that, that's served me well, you know, through Hollywood is, is the creator. I used to tell people, I've done a lot of TV series. And so, and, and kids would come in, you know, I mean, new kids, you know, hadn't done it before, and they, you know, get the first check, and all of a sudden they had, you know, room size stereo speakers, you know, what I mean, and that kind of stuff. And I said, you know, let me give you a little bit of advice and stuff. First, be on time, be on time, then be prepared, you know, know your lines, you know, what I mean, do your work, you know, understand, you know, what this reality is about, what this movie is about, what this TV series is about. And then my last piece of advice was, tell them your birthday is next week. So the studio sends you a gift before the shit gets canceled. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then you've made it. That's great. <laughs> Please, come, ask your questions. Um, well, confession, I'm not a Tulane student. And I snuck over from Loyola. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, uh, I do consider myself one of those passionate people, and I've always wanted to be a, a movie maker, and I consider myself a writer-director. Um, and, you know, for most of my life, I've been writing movies, making short films, because I love doing it. And I'm just beginning to think, like, maybe I should do this professionally. So, you know, I, I've written for so long, and I guess my question's mostly for you, Mr. Lawner. What's the best way, then, to go and get an agent, or to actually break in? Do you have a script? Five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working uh, on the fifth. I'm I mean, listen, fifth. here's here, here, here's the story. I um, usually, I, I, I mean, you, then you're doing it the right way. You got you, 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 you to write a script, and anybody who's going to evaluate you is going gonna, is gonna to read that and see what your talent is based on that. And God knows how many you're going to have to write until you get a representative, so I would say to keep going. What you run into in Hollywood is, um, for people like me and other representatives who have been doing it for a while, is that we won't take unsolicited material unless it has been submitted to us by an industry professional. Mm -hmm. So if Jimmy, Chris, Steve, Harold calls me to say, hey, I've read this, I think it's worth your time, I would take a look at it. One of the reasons that we can't is because there's so many ways to uh, not that you would do this, but there are ways for able to say, "Oh, David Lana read my script, and then uh, uh, there was a there was an element in that script that his client J.J. Abrams just went and used in the Star Trek sequel." I'm gonna go sue him. Right. So it's, it, it, um, but cream does rise to the top, and if you write something that affects somebody, that means it's going to affect somebody else. That means that it'll eventually get in the hands of a proper representative who then can present it to the community as, you know, here is, what's your name? Kirby. Kirby. Let me introduce Kirby to you. But, um, it, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a complicated question because because we're here at Tulane, part of me wants to say, yeah, I'll read your script. Um, but 
you know, it, it has to go through proper channels. And again, that's lawyers, uh, I mean, anybody who's involved in the Hollywood community. But if you do write a good script, it'll get there. Okay. Um, because there are so few of them, really. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good luck. Hi, my name's Isabel. Um, I guess my question is that um, most all of you focused on going out and kind of living and exploring other things before you go to Hollywood. But eventually you're gonna get to Hollywood. And to, for someone, for me, um, where acting has, and, and being an actress, it's always been a dream. But I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, Midwest, you know, far, far away. When you get there, there are people that have been there, that have been, that have, res, you know, a thick resume. They're union affiliated. They've had agents since they were 12, you know, um, younger maybe. What is the first step for someone who's just coming in fresh and is just like, I need to get my foot in the door. I need someone to listen to me do a monologue. I need someone to just kind of see there's something here. How do you, how do you get there? How do you get someone to notice you? So I don't know, maybe David or... I think Harold is the best. Harold. Yeah. There are a lot of good actors from Cleveland. You know, <laughs> they, you know, I, mean, I, can, I can name a couple that are doing network television right now. So, yeah, I mean, don't, you know, I mean, don't, that, that is not a liability. You know, you're already a part of a community. Uh, so, but, you know, I think, again, you know, the new technology, you know, I mean, it allows you to do something that not a lot of people, you know, that we couldn't do, certainly, you know, I mean, all those years ago. And so, if, you know, I mean, yes, do that monologue. Quote, quote unquote, not, nobody will understand what it is, you know, so, but you know, I mean, put that scene together you know, and, so, and, you know, and work it until it comes across you know, I mean, you know, on film. It can happen, you know, I mean, at, at you know, the level that you guys are dealing with. I did a, a project here at Tulane with Ron Goral, you know, and stuff, and pre, pre Katrina, just, uh, you know, I mean, pre, you know, pre, pre Katrina, where we were you know, trying to figure out, you know, I mean, what that relationship was uh, and so between, you know, creating and the new technology. And we used the generic, you know, I mean, I guess what they were calling, um, 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 well, you know, just below the pro level, you know, I mean, you know, prosumer, you know, I mean, you know, kind of equipment uh, and stuff. And we got viable performances. We actually made a good movie. We wrote a script in the classroom in the, over the period of a, of, a, of a semester and made a two hour movie. You know, so you can do that, that seven minute movie, you know, I mean, that, that, that makes you a star, that makes you shine. But I think one of the keys is that, what people who've got their hands on a new technology don't realize is that you know, Hollywood is a really comprehensive business. It is not about acting. You know, I mean, you, you, you are not wonderful because you're a good actor. You're wonderful because the wardrobe picked a good combination for you. The set dresser did a good job. The lighting guy, you know, I mean, made you shine in a good light. You know, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, it is, it is, it is, it is a, it's a very social business. Get those friends together, learn how to make movies, learn the elements of movies, do you think, put it out there. I, I, Har Harold is, is right, because one of the other things that, that we find is that there is, um, you know, there's, there, there's a generational coming up of the artists that start when you start, and it's all the people who, who work in that collaborative way, you know, all of the craftsmen, all of the technical people, um, and, you know, there's and 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 there's and it's also it's a very Darwinian process, you know, because you, you you know you come out all bright-eyed and, and 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 optimistic, and you get the crap kicked out of you, and you get people who kick you in the stomach and tell you you're not talented, you're never going to make it, you don't have the intestinal fortitude for it, um, you know, get out of here. And it's your ability to sort of pick yourself back up, really be able to listen to some harsh criticism because you know there's a lot of it, and take it in and you know, keep on forging forward. But the idea that Harold said that you gotta surround yourself with people who can help you isn't just in the agent and manager way. It's really sort of this collective community of artists that you will be part of and most importantly that you'll grow up around that, you know, within a certain period of time will end up becoming the predominant, you know, generation of, uh, you know, of the moment. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name's Jay. Uh, I'm a Tulane student, not like a Loyola student that snuck over. Uh, <laughs> um, not that that makes me any better than you. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, 
Uh, I guess I noticed a common theme among uh, sort of the panel about uh, this sort of pil pilgrimage to um, to LA, and that was sort of an important part of everyone's life, even if it wasn't specifically to get into film. It was it was necessary to be there in order to fall into film. Um, and I'm wondering if you think that that's true today. Um, there's a lot of talk in New Orleans right now about the whole Hollywood South thing. Um, I know I had the opportunity to PA on uh, So Undercover last January, um, which was an incredible experience. Um, so is it necessary to, to go to LA and knock on people's doors, or is there opportunity here or elsewhere um, for someone who's aspiring to enter the business? I mean, the way I would answer is I, I really think it depends on what you want to do. Um, we made two movies here last year. We're, we're going to make three movies here in the next year. Um, there's a tremendous opportunity if you want to work in production. Um, and again, even there, you know, we bring certain people from LA, and those are the keys. And then we hire a local crew. And so there's obviously a crew base growing here, which is great for local economy and great for people who have a specific desire to work in a certain craft. Um, whether those jobs will actually ever lead to something more in the business or not is hard to say. And there are a lot of people who um, get stuck in more uh, kind of, you know, assistant jobs and they don't necessarily, not, you know, there's not as much opportunity. If you're committed to staying here, it's, it's possible for you to be successful. But I think it, I, I do think that by and large, and particularly if you want to work on the creative side of the business and if you want to be, a, I mean, particularly if you want to act, which is, I'm sure everyone would agree, the hardest of all of the things to do. It's it's not a meritorious system. Who makes and who doesn't is not always because you are the best or aren't the best at what you do. Um, I do think that is the kind of thing that, and, and, and that you should be there. And, and, and the main reason is because there's just so much more opportunity there than there is anywhere else. It doesn't mean you can't have a great career in New York. It's just more limited and therefore going to be that much harder. Um, everything just grows exponentially when you're in, when you're in LA um, and how things happen. I think that you could have another panel of people here who would tell you that every one of them got lucky and that they were working in a restaurant or they were discovered at a, at a, at a, at a small theater, you know, on Santa Monica Boulevard. You know, it's just, it's just that that's where it is. And so you have to decide what your level of commitment is. Um, and something David said before, you know, he figured out what he needed to do to get a job in the mailroom. And I think that still applies today. You know, you, you have to figure out, I mean, what Harold was saying, if you're from Cleveland, and he's saying that there are people on network television who are from Cleveland, you should know who they are. And I, I think our business, as much as it is, it is difficult, it can be ugly, it, is, it's, it's, it can be rough. People are also very generous. And they all got, especially on the, on the talent side of the business, somebody helped them in all likelihood. And I find that it's amazing how much people are willing to do for someone who they meet who's young and up and coming and wants to break in. And, you know, whether it's making a phone call for you or getting you an audition or introducing you to a casting director at the studio, um, I do it. If someone calls me and says, I know someone who's a young actor, I have a meet with the head of casting at the studio. It's, I mean, it's something I can do. I, it makes me feel great to offer it back. And and um, while I didn't have someone from Tulane who who helped me get there, I can promise you that if you went to Tulane and you contact anyone who's on this panel and you say I'm a Tulane student and you send us an email, you'll get a response. And that's the other thing. You know, it's so much easier today than it was for us because of the way you can communicate with someone by sending them an email. It's not as intrusive. You don't have to get through to their office. So while I do think that you can be successful in the industry, not being in LA, it just makes a big difference if you are. Uh, to that to that point, I actually hired my my current assistant because she was, a, and not because, but one of the main factors that you know got my eyes open was she was a Tulane graduate. Um, if I can ask another question, um, no, no, okay, <laughs> at the reception then. <laughs> uh, I, I think we can we can have one more person ask a question, and then um, the panelists will be happy to chat with y'all at the reception in Woodward Way. Thank you, Tina. Hello, my name is Hope Barnard. I'm an actress, um, and I'm also working on a writing career. I have a really good friend who's a director, and he's working or he's studying at uh, Union University in Tennessee right now. And we kind of want to be like a Ben Affleck, Matt Damon team. <laughs> Are you um, from Cleveland? <laughs> no, I am from Mobile, Alabama, where. <laughs> Really, the three nothing actors from Mobile working on TV series right now. Yeah, I, I hopefully I'll be one of them. Um, 
so I guess my question is, in this new kind of democratizing environment that you speak of, would your recommendation be going the Sylvester Stallone slash Matt and Ben route of presenting a good script and having uh, you know, storyboards and things prepared and saying, we want you to do this, but you've got to do it with us in it, or would you recommend trying to find producers and doing it yourself? And uh, time, so part, B to that question <laughs> is, <laughs> part B to that question is, um, following the last question in your response, may I have your email address? <laughs> Where's Isabel? <laughs> um, you know, as far as the, 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 the uh, Damon Affleck angle, you know, they, I, I don't know the specifics behind it. I've heard it, you know, I've had friends that were involved with Goodwill Hunting. You know, David could probably speak more to it because it was a, I believe it was a William Morris package, but I'm not sure. Well, it was, uh, yeah, no, well, it was um, pa Patrick Weitzel when he was at uh, either UTA or CAA, I remember, but yeah. But it's, you know, look, those guys said, I'm, we're sticking with this, and you either make the movie with us or you don't. But if someone offers, if you write a great script that is just socks off incredible, and someone's gonna say to you, we will give you a million dollars for this. No way. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> then you know what? Then stand by it. You know, there was a story and I cannot remember the name of the script and you guys might be able to jump in on this. That there was a, a Western that was written a few years ago by the actress Madeline Stowe okay. and she was offered four million dollars for the script and she told the studio to go take a hike. Yeah. She said, if I'm not gonna be in this, you're not getting the script. I have an amazing amount of admiration for them, for her, though $4 million is a lot of money <laughs> to walk away from. So if... And, and this, this script still has not gotten made. Yeah. So I think if you have that much tenacity and that much belief in the material and people are telling you how great it is, then it's, it's your choice to say, either I am a part of this or you're not getting the opportunity to make this movie. And either they will fold or, or they won't. But you know, it's, it's, it's a moment to moment decision. It's like you, one week you could say no chance and then a, a year later when you're eating cornflakes <laughs> dry because you do, can't afford the milk um, and they're still saying, all right, we're gonna pay you for this script, you know, your attitude may change. One other thing though, it, um and it kind of goes back to what Isabel was saying about, um, I don't think collecting experiences and working on what you want to do are mutually exclusive. Okay. To, to that end, the Matt and Ben story, they, they use, it's not like they walked to Hollywood, they got to Hollywood and they said, make this or else. That thing was in development for, uh, for several years. A guy named William Goldman, who's famous for saying nobody knows anything. Yeah, um, I've anyway, read about him. Helped them with it. I mean, it, there was, so along the way, I'm sure they entered frustrations. They were doing whatever else they could. I think taking acting jobs, whatever. So, you know, the legend now is that they came to Hollywood and stu stood by their guns. But there's a lot more behind that. And, uh, yeah, Matt Damon did a movie called Courage Under Fire, which got him some notices. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was sort of the, a little bit of a leg up, and Ben Affleck did a whole bunch of movies for Kevin Smith, mm -hmm. which also gave him a little bit of a profile. So they, it wasn't, it, and, and don't forget, you know, I remember, it, you know, because I grew up then, Sylvester Stallone did a movie called The Lords of Flatbush before he, uh, he came to Erwin Winkler and Bob Chodroff with Rocky. So, you, you know, listen, you, you, it's, it's what Steve said. You, but part of coming out to L.A. and understanding it is, is also getting an education about Hollywood. And, you know, there's, uh, there's really a lot to learn, like in any business. And so you'll ha it's great that you have the attitude now, and I hope to God your script is amazing and that you're, Me too. you're, that, you're, that, nec you're, you're that next generation. But there's a lot that you'll go through when you come out and you experience what the business of this business is that may, you know, sort of either alter you or inspire you to keep on your course. Yeah. And then with the email thing, I do kind of like wonder what is the protocol for like making connections like that? Like how much can you ask somebody, you know, you talk about like how generous 
um, restraining actors order. are. Yeah, <laughs> but, but like, how much can you actually say, like, hey, can I have your email address and actually ask you, you know, a question before you're stepping on somebody's toes? It depends on how big the gift certificate is that's attached to the email. Okay. <laughs> no, it's it, listen. It's like any letter. It's like your it, it's 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 your essay that got you into this school. If we read a thoughtful email from somebody who goes to Tulane, every you know you're gonna get you're gonna get a call back from everybody. Everybody's gonna have you come up to their office and and, and sit and talk to you. It, it you know it's how you present yourself. It's, okay. yes, it's understanding that everybody here and whoever else it is that you're that you're uh, querying are really busy, and to be brief and succinct and respectful. And knowing that, you know, hopefully someone will read it and say, all right, you're a Tulane student. I was a Tulane student. I like the way that this woman wrote this. I'll give her 20 minutes of my time. Thank you very much. Can we give our panelists a great big hand? Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, obviously, and Beretta for moderating, keeping everybody in line. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I know that you all want to give your emails to our panelists, so <laughs> please join us in Woodward Way. Uh, we also have a gift for our panelists, which I think you're going to get. Um, well, but we can leave it in here. And it, it, it really is about the renaissance of Tulane. And I, I was delighted that you spoke about that because the things that have been happening since Katrina are just this incredible, dramatic, made-for-movie story. And you're all part of that. So I really want to thank you all for coming as well. So please join us outside for the reception. Thank you. Thank you.